Original. Hello and welcome to Web Crawlers, the podcast where we do a deep dive into some of our favorite unsolved mysteries. Each week we will introduce our topic, lay out our research and findings, reveal some conspiracy theories, and conclude with our own hypothesis. Who knows? We might even solve the case. We also have a special interview for this podcast. I'm Ali Siegel. And I'm Melissa Stetton. Before we deep dive into our main story, we're going to start off with the weird thing we discovered this week. The first one I'm really excited about. I'm sure you are. I actually don't know how I found it. I I literally don't remember, which scares me that because I terrifying. found it. I found it yesterday. <laughs> but Barney the dinosaur guy is now a tantric sex therapist. That's disgusting. It truly is gross. He said <laughs> that he learned he learned how to be a good lover from being in the Barney suit. What does that's no, that's gross. Isn't that perverted? He said no. that he learned he learned like the tenets of tantric sex when he was Barney the dinosaur because the show was all about like love and feelings and like human connection. Oh no. Yeah. Oh no. I know. That's like a weird place to start. And okay, this is from a Vice article. His name is David Joyner. Um, for the for three hundred and fifty dollars, but the first the first first is one's free. First one's free. Oh, which is the loophole, so it's not prostitution. Oh, that's yeah. A so good like scam. the first one is consensual sex, and then everything thereafter is three fifty. Oh so it's God. just kind of like a paid relationship or whatever. Cool. The female clients, the only kind he accepts. Only female. Clients. Only female clients can expect a ritual bath, chakra balancing a massage, and cosmic, mind-blowing orgasms. Oh. (laughs) And he calls his clients goddesses. And through these cosmic, mind-blowing orgasms, he unblocks their energy. I found him on Facebook and there there was an event. We just missed it. Oh, it no. Women's Salon, Sexual Empowerment and the Philosophy of Tantra. Fuck, Featuring David it? Joyner. It was January 24th. He lives in LA. Oh my God. We need to sign. Does he have a newsletter? We need to sign up and go to his next thing. No, he has a Facebook. The, it was hosted at the Not So Secret Garden. Where is that? I don't know. <laughs> Ew, that sounds gross. I don't like it. But we should sign up for his newsletter and go to his next thing. Oh, okay. So anyways, he's a tantric sex therapist now, in case anyone's wondering. What is tantric sex? Great question. I know Sting does it. I think it's when you delay your orgasm so that it's more powerful. Yeah, because it can last like hours, I think. Days even. Days? (laughs) I know. Okay, wait. Tantric sex. It's about transcending both the sexual and spiritual planes by engaging in deeply meditative, spontaneous, and intimate sex. Like the only thing I've heard about it is like... It just takes hours. Like, I guess you yeah. meditate and then. I think it's just like about like the inti- intimate connection with someone else. Like sexy meditation. Yes. Orgasmic meditation. Yeah. In Sanskrit, it means woven together. Sure it does. Uniting as one. That's so anyway, cool. popular tantric sex people. Do you remember, Sting and Barney the dinosaur. Remember Barney the dinosaur? There was like a rumor that he was in jail. Because he he hid cocaine in his tail. No. And he would like give it to kids. I don't think no, it was Melissa. true. <laughs> but there was. Like, I heard that the Blues around. Clues guy died of a heroin overdose. But then that's not true because no, I saw him on, on Raya. He follows me on Twitter. What? Really? Steve. Yeah. Sup? No, he's alive. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, I know he's alive because we matched on Raya. Did you talk to him? I can't remember if I talked to him. Okay. Our next mystery. We, do, we have two just because they're shorter ones is um, a mashed potato mystery that was happening in Mississippi. I love the article. It says it's a mashed Mississippi mystery. Fantastic copy. Um, In a a small Mississippi community, bowls of mashed potatoes (laughs) kept mysteriously appearing everywhere on people's cars, porches, and mailboxes. 
on the streets but why yeah a woman said she, i walked outside yesterday at 7 a.m got in my car and that's when i noticed a white bowl on my windshield it was full of rainwater i threw it away and i was grossed out by it yeah and then they kept finding him subsequently everywhere and the Someone whole town is just like up, up in arms they don't know who's doing it yeah so some, some people think maybe they're poison to kill animals yeah which is another crazy thing and then someone said i didn't taste it i have a three second rule so i didn't touch it but some people are worried <laughs> that was What's our favorite three part? second rule have to do with mashed potatoes so bizarre um but anyways if you have any information about the mashed potato <laughs> murderer or if you know anything about tantric sex yeah, I don't really know a lot about it. Yeah, please hit us up. Hit us up at webcrawlerspod at gmail.com or on Twitter at web- webcrawlerspod and Instagram of the same name. Yeah, DM us uh, pictures of you and your significant other having tantrums. <laughs> Cool. And we'll post, we'll them post the best on ones. our Patreon. Um, anyways, should we get on with our uh, episode? Yeah, let's let's get to the main story. Okay. They say there was once a game, a game unlike any other, that infiltrated arcades. There is a video game that doesn't exist. This is the next generation of video games, but these ones are not just for kids. It's called Polybius. Millions of people are addicted to hours of gazing at electronic images on games. In 1981. Around 1981. 1981. Video games are taking this country by storm. In the outskirts of Portland. Fucking game. Sinuslotion. 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 And then there's Stephen Roach. The program was called Project MK Ultra. Poof. It disappeared. And they've never been seen since. In this episode, we're discussing the legend of Polybius, an arcade game invented in 1981 that was supposedly the subject of a government run psychological experiment. It caused seizures, nightmares, and many psychoactive effects in the players. It was suddenly removed from the arcade by two men in black with no explanation. Was it an urban legend or a secret experiment to spy on our brains? Here is what you need to know. In 1981, a mysterious video game showed up in the arcades around Portland, Oregon. It was a black box with no name. The gameplay incorporated rapidly revolving kaleidoscopic puzzles with numeric shapes and subliminal messages that deeply affected the consciousness of some players. People who claim to have played the game or know someone who did say that the game caused anxiety, depression, night terrors, suicide, and even sudden death. Polybius was a Greek historian from circa 118 BC who analyzed the importance of the separation of powers in government weird choice for a video game name. Additionally, the company attributed to making the game was called Sinisloschen, an incorrectly made German word which loosely translates to sensory deprivation. The players felt as if they were no longer in control of their thoughts after playing this game, that they were still being prompted to think negative thoughts, many of them feeling like they were a danger to themselves. Some people believe Polybius was a product of the CIA's MK Ultra program, an experiment in mind control and physical agility targeting youth to recruit soldiers, like in the movie The Last Starfighter. Others believe it may have been recalled Tempest Prototype, which was a game known to cause seizures, but no one has ever been able to confirm its existence. According to legend, Men in Black began to show up to collect some form of data from the machines, allegedly testing responses to the game. It was reported that sometimes the Men in Black could be seen going into the cabinets, inspecting them, sometimes taking out unknown parts and quietly walking away. Oftentimes, they loaded them up in trucks and transported them elsewhere. Then one day, they took all the Polybius machines away and they were never seen again. Let's talk about some of the actual real things that happened in the 80s related to the Polybius claims. So, kids were getting sick from video games in Portland in November 1981. In the span of a week, three children got ill upon playing video games at arcades in the Portland area. There was a 14-year-old kid named Michael Lopez who got a migraine, the first he had ever had from playing Tempest. He said he felt a weird sensation in the back of his head, then his vision started going out. Then he threw up all over the parking lot. He couldn't speak or walk. 
At school, there were rumors going around that the game took over his mind. No one played it since. On the same day at the very same arcade, Brian Morrow, a 12-year-old trying to set the world record for asteroids for the longest time played, the previous record was 52 hours, fell ill after playing for only 28 hours only. He wore wrist guards and a tuxedo <laughs> and only drank orange juice and Coke. But I imagine the stomach pains were from probably only <laughs> drinking orange juice and Coke for 28 hours straight. He had to spend the next two days in bed. Yeah, no kidding. A week later, 18-year-old competitive gamer Jeff Daly died due to a heart attack after chasing the world record in Berserk. One year later, 19-year-old Peter Burkowski followed suit for the same reason playing the same game. There was a government test on an arcade and the habits of its players as ruled by the Supreme Court in November of 1981. It was in Mesquite, Texas at Aladdin's Castle after Atari opposed a Texas ordinance that tried to ban children under the age of 17 from using a coin-operated game. The test was to study if video games were addicted enough to stop minors from playing them. Well, Allie, have you ever gotten sick from a video game? No. But <laughs> I like how you phrased that, though. No, because I'm not a total nerd. But <laughs> but there's so much of this that's interesting to me because, like, the causing epilepsy thing, I do have epilepsy. So right. I don't, like, I would have been a goner had I yeah. gone to one of these arcades. And because there's a, I told you, there's a Rihanna video I can't watch. Oh, right. It's that the... I still haven't seen it. It's one with all like the flashing like words on the screen. Yeah, I can't watch it. Oh. And I also am afraid to watch Pikachu or Pokemon. Oh, Pokemon. Yeah. So the two great loves in my life. You Rihanna and Rihanna. Pokemon I can't indulge wow. in. You must be so depressed. I'm really depressed all the time. But we actually, <laughs> <laughs> due to this, having nothing to do with the epilepsy, having everything to do with the Rihanna and the Pokemon stuff. Um, but we're actually really lucky because we just so happen to know someone <laughs> who's a video game aficionado <laughs> someone who happens to have the world record in anteater yeah get yeah, that mic maria. out our producer maria i actually didn't know anything about this melissa yeah we've got a, a famous celebrity i also don't know what anteater is i have like so many questions is it like dig dug I don't know. Maria's plugging in her microphone. She'll... Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, I have the world record. <laughs> <laughs> I have the world record in a, in a 1983 video game or 82 video game called Anteater. How did wow. you achieve that? Well, my boyfriend is very into video games. Okay. Or like old arcade games. And so we have a Donkey Kong machine in our living room, but he can plug <laughs> different games into the like, oh, cabinet. Oh, that's And cool. so he had, he was like putting in different ones and like I would try each one and then he put an anteater one day and I just like was like really connected to it. <laughs> <laughs> You're in a group. I was like, for some reason I was like doing really well. Like, mm. and he kind of just said, well, you're really like, you're like, I kept dying and stuff, but he was like, you're actually really good at this. You should try to get good at this. And so like whenever we'd be watching something that I maybe didn't want to watch on TV or something, I'd sit down and I just start playing. And it's basically, I can show you guys a little bit. I basically started just playing it every night for, you know, 30 minutes or whatever, and getting really good at it. And when I got good enough at it, we looked up what the, the high score was and it had <laughs> been done in 1980. Whoa. Uh, hold on, let me see. Hi. Wow, okay, so you type in, this is how legit this is. I oh typed in Anteater High Score and my name is the number one. Stop it! Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, Maria Blasucci Twin Galaxies, which is like the official mm -hmm. like world record video game site. So then this video that they have on here is the entire. So once I got good enough, we looked up the high mm -hmm. score and then I was like trying to beat that high score. And once I beat the high score, then we had to film it so that oh, it could right. be oh, shut up, really? to make it legit. Yeah. So then I so I beat it a couple times. But so like oh, this, this is a video. Is this you, you playing? OK, so that's like our Donkey Kong machine. 
wait okay so that's like because you have to show that it's all legit you have to oh. show like and then so this is my boyfriend doing all this so then like he goes in the back and he shows that they can't, can't have another billy mitchell situation exactly. so that it's all like copacetic we're all good and then so he has to like show all of this oh my god because then what happens is then I, we then we you send in the high score and then all of the video game guys vote as to whether it's legit or not right yeah you're showing right now like the guts of the yeah so then i sit down to play and so we set up like a little gopro and so this is my game was it on play. your head was it like a helmet no with a no he, he put it onto the he put it onto the donkey kong machine so this is the game so like you're this ant eater and you have to go eat all your little dots without getting hit you can eat the white ants from the front but you can't eat the blue guys from the front you can only eat them from the back and if a blue guy or white guy touches your tongue then you die oh my so god so it's kind of like a pac-man meets ant eaters <laughs> how long were you playing it for yeah so this how long is like 30 this is like a 30 minute there's like 25 minutes so yeah so then i so then we submitted it and then they verified me and then now i have a trading card Shut wait up. so that took you like 30 minutes to get the high score yeah Wow. And so the last high score, I think, was in 1982, I think. Has anyone tried to challenge you since? No. So anyway, so yeah, I do come from... I, I did get into that gaming world a little bit. Do you feel like the game helped you learn any skills that could be applicable to your real life? Just determination and hard work. <laughs> <laughs> and achieving your goals. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, other than that, no, I mean, maybe some hand eye coordination or something. Cause yeah, I think sure. the crossover or at least like, we're not there yet, but in terms of like my theories, it's like, why, what are the point of video games? Right. Like, is it something that they're trying to teach us in real life? Right. So I'm wondering like, yeah, I, I think they're just, they're cool. Like I love puzzles and I love, that's why I like this, that game a lot other than like like, yeah. like you're just like shooting ones. stuff i don't like yeah. that kind of stuff i like ones where i have to like assume things are going to happen or problem solve i like, like right. kind of mm -hmm. stuff yeah. i like to problem solve in games so that was very much like why that spoke to me that game it's like um what was that oh. movie with um all the bugs um a bug's life no <laughs> but it's it's like the bugs come and like an invade earth and then a alien it's like at this point so not important <laughs> i think i know what you're talking Where about starship like, troopers starship, starship troopers. troopers yeah yeah i was just gonna say like you would be like neil patrick harris in that Aww, movie because yeah he, yeah i haven't seen it <laughs> so we, it's a compliment yeah yeah so yeah i'm uh you know and my boyfriend craig anstett is very much in the video game world and knows you know basically he, he knows it all does he have any high scores yeah he has wow. a high score. We have, we're a high score couple. He has. We both have our trading cards framed. That's so hot. Oh my god. Uh, his high score is in a game called Pepper Two. Pepper Two. Never heard of it. Mm -hmm. Huh. Yeah. Huh. Did you experience any side effects from your excessive ant eater playing? Just kind of antisocial, okay. um, <laughs> extreme focus. Wow. That's um, a plus, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I literally just put on like a podcast and play. I mean, it's like oh. really cool. Like once you get the hang of a certain game. Right. To like just like it helps you zone out. It's really nice. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you, Maria. Yeah. Might, thanks, Maria. Thanks for stopping back by. Later with some more questions. Thank you very much, you guys. No, thank you for <laughs> thank you for coming today. Oh, thank you. <laughs> wow. Insightful. So aside from the kids getting sick some more actual things that were happening in the 80s. Government agents did seize and load up video games in 1981 and 1982 on two separate occasions. Mm. They would take down the initials of high scores on games as a way to determine the names of possible eyewitnesses to on-site crimes they were investigating. Because apparently arcades in the 80s were popular places to sell stolen goods and gamble. Mm. So the government agents purchased games from Portland arcade operators, wired them with cameras and microphones, and set them up in an arcade in West Seattle to catch thieves. The agents thought that while the subjects were playing the game, they might unknowingly make incriminating statements, unaware they were being filmed and recorded. 
and the reason they used Tempest was because the smoked glass on the screen was ideal for hiding cameras. Mm. So a few arcades went without Tempest games for a few days while the cameras were being installed. So people probably thought that was like very suspicious. Interesting. Uh, government agents also inspected the backs of certain games, looking for cords that led to counters and other illegal apparatuses used in gambling. And on occasion, they removed unknown parts from games because of that reason. So how did this whole thing start? Well, in 2006, a post showed up on coinop.org, which is a popular gaming blog that's no longer active, from someone claiming to be the creator of Polybius. So this guy named Steven Roach said he owned a company called Sinishlossen mm -hmm. uh, in the Czech Republic that was set up by him and several other amateur programmers in 1978. They were approached in 1980 by a South American company to develop an idea for an arcade game with a puzzle element that centered around a new approach to video game graphics. Uh, they created the game and was told it was too intense and addictive, so they kept altering it and it was finally accepted and placed in an arcade for a test run. But six days later, a 14-year-old boy had a seizure playing it. So the company directors went to the arcade to remove the game uh, apparently, the company made a settlement to the boy's family, and Sinish Lawson was disbanded shortly after. Stephen wrote, also wrote, I still believe we created something that should have changed the face of gaming and would have set us apart from the rest of the industry. But arcade games were often compared to drugs at that time because of their addictiveness, and we created something that small-minded bureaucrats perceived to be the heroine of the video game world. Its only crime was to be many years ahead of its time. Now you have you have a whole oh god I went down the Stephen Roach rabbit hole. Yeah, I want to hear your Stephen Roach rabbit hole because I think actually for this you and I have different theories. Yeah, I was looking up the Stephen Roach guy and trying to see how he's if he's a real person, right? Um, and then I found this magazine article from 2012 this retrocade article um about polybius and this reporter said that Stephen roach and his wife glenda were both former police officers from utah mm. they were the security directors of a notorious behavioral modification center for teens called sunrise beach in baja mexico in 1994 parents would pay around 30 grand for their kids to be reformed using Oof. prison techniques. Uh, this academy in Mexico that they ran had 57 children between the ages of 15 and 18. They put them in solitary confinement. They beat them. They tortured them. They chained them. They put them in cages like dogs. They forced them to eat their own vomit and <gasps> they sexually abused them. So two years later, in 1996, it was closed by Mexican authorities after three girls escaped and knocked on doors of nearby houses. Uh, the Roaches were arrested on charges of illegally detaining children and running an unlicensed and unsanitary facility. They spent two months in jail and then they fled to the Czech Republic. And then in 1998, two years after that, they opened the Morava Academy in the Czech Republic, which is a similar type of academy. And it was also raided by the Czech police and shut down after allegations of child abuse. So the Roaches were arrested again and charged. They were let out on bail, but they escaped the country and they've never faced trial. Holy shit, are they missing? Or are they yes. So this would have been, if this was 1981, and the thing that he was doing in Mexico was when? It was the 90s? It was 94. So, so this would have been the first experiment he ever did, I guess, with mind yeah. stuff? Yeah. Well, I was, that's why I was thinking that he, after they got arrested in Mexico, like, why would they flee to the Czech Republic unless he had previously lived there for 10 years working on this game? He he told Glenda, his wife is like, yo, I have like contacts in the Czech Republic. Let's go back there. Yeah. Open up another school. And that's what they did. But then they got arrested again because the 80s is when the Sina Schlossen was supposedly yes. created. And he would have been in his like late 20s, early 30s. So he worked at Sina Schlossen in the 80s. And then moved back. And then mo that makes total sense. 
the that website where I found their address is the Family Tree Now website that I love I so love much. it when you go and on the Family Tree website. I found another site, PIPL.com. What is that? It's just a site where you find people's addresses and phone numbers. So I tried to find a Stephen and Glenda Roach living in Utah where they were police officers. And I found a 61-year-old Stephen Patrick Roach and a Glenda K. <gasps> Roach. Because this article in The Guardian said that they were 41 and 52 at the time. So I calculated their ages and they would have been born in 45 and 57. So these have to be the same too. They lived at the same address in Utah. (laughs) Oh my God, Melissa, you're so scary. And there's a bunch of different mailing addresses for the mostly in Utah, California, Alabama. But during 1993 to 1996, while they were running that Baja Mexico Academy, their address is listed as 8933 Cadillac Avenue, Los Angeles, California, which makes sense if they were running an academy in Mexico. Yes. Having an address in LA makes sense. Where's Cadillac Avenue? That's like Pico Robertson, like mid city. What if that's where the Cecil Hotel was or something? (laughs) (laughs) Well, that also kind of, because I had two theories and that kind of goes into mine. And maybe Stephen Roach is part of my theory too is that he's part of the MK Ultra program which is it started in I think it started in the 50s in the U.S. and also Canada where the CIA was doing different kinds of testing Mm -hmm. on people in terms of like mind play and they're using like LSD oh yeah and all sorts of crazy stuff to see how they can like control people's brains and stuff like that and I think that like maybe Stephen Roach could have worked for the CIA or maybe he was part of this yeah yeah because this MK Ultra thing is kind of bizarre which I hadn't ever heard but this is like substantiated like people who are in the CIA have actually talked about like MK Ultra and all the different things okay yeah it was a CIA mind control program where experiments on human subjects were designed and undertaken by the CIA a lot of them were illegal a lot of them use drugs. Mm-hmm. There was one that happened. Um, it was like called Operation Climax, where they did it in brothels, where they would give what? they would give people um, men LSD and then see how they reacted to like the women in brothels. See how they reacted. Yeah. So my. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> I know so my thing is that I think that maybe the Polybius machines were part of this MK Ultra yeah they were testing doing like mind control testing and that instead of actually like dispensing LSD that you had said you know the the game had kaleidoscopic right things that which could have like the same visual representation co subliminal messages in it these kids are under this mk ultra like umbrella and they're trying to test it out in like various generational levels like you know we'll test it out with you know the hippies and give them acid Uh and then with the kids we'll do it in arcade games and see how they can be affected you know we aren't going to give little kids acid but what if we do a video game that does the same kind of like effects of like what an LSD trick right. would be like. And then also do subliminal messaging and see how much, you know, they can stand of that and what the effects would be like. And a lot of these effects that they're feeling are the same as like PTSD from like a bad trip. Oh yeah. D- yeah. You know, like the headaches and like the vomiting headaches, and like vomiting night terror. Yeah. Like freaking out. And then like the weird craving for more. So I think that these kids were unknowingly part of a government testing once the mk ultra i think it was in like the 70s that it got disbanded okay let's just take a a deeper dive into mk ultra for a second so i found some of these documents on the black vault which is a website that publishes all those okay so what is this website it's just a website i found that has all like twenty thousand of the documents from mk ultra and it has pretty much everything on it I would spend hours and hours reading through it, but I know I would. I mean, that's insane. They have a whole section for UFOs. Mm -hmm. So one of the documents is by a doctor with a redacted name. The document's from 1965. Dr. Melissa Stetton. (laughs) No. It's it's called, the document's called Remote Controlled Behavior with Rewarding Electrical Stimulation of the Brain. So the aim of this program was to examine the possibility of controlling the behavior of a dog 
by remotely triggering electrical stimulation of the brain. So the dogs would run, stop, and turn. But apparently there were bad side effects like infections at the electrode site due to the surgical wound not healing. Mm. Uh, They used a helmet that embedded the electrode within the skull and they attach it to a harness on the dog. That'd be really obvious on a human. (laughs) (laughs) After implanting the electrodes in the dog's brain, a battery pack and a stimulator was added to the harness through which signals could be sent to the electrodes. The, The doctor said the uses for this type of experiment would be for dogs to carry ammunition and messages in dangerous terrain you could use it as a guided missile to detonate from a distance oh. and and as a scout. That's so mean. But the control was limited to distances of 100 to 200 yards, which is not that far. They could use robots for that now. Yeah, so it was never utilized because they couldn't really find an actual purpose for it. But this still happened. Um, so we've talked about LSD, which was the main, I think, theme of MK Ultra is the use of drugs to yeah. control people's minds. Um, So the CIA administered LSD to mental patients, prisoners, drug addicts, and prostitutes. In one case, they gave a mental patient LSD for 174 days straight. Oh, no. (laughs) No. They also gave it to CIA employees, doctors, government agents, and members of the general public, like you were talking the beach thing. Yeah. One CIA operative was given LSD in his morning coffee, became psychotic, and ran across a crosh he <laughs> ran across washington seeing a monster in every car passing him and then a doctor who was given lsd jumped off a building after being given it unsuspectingly and i read in one of the documents they had like protocols for when stuff like this would happen yeah like things that they w- could you know prepare for yeah which is crazy and like That's liabilities insane. yeah i found out that whitey bulger who's you know famous mobster He said that while he was at Alcatraz in 1957, he was recruited for a project to find a cure for schizophrenia. There's a weird link between schizophrenia and MKUltra. Yeah. Well, this study, the thought behind it was that schizophrenia was similar to LSD. Interesting. And so if they could find an antidote for LSD, that it would probably work for schizophrenia. Also, kind of makes sense. I think that they wanted to like implant voices in people's head to control their minds. Yeah. Which is, I guess, kind of what schizophrenia is. Yeah. Like having other voices in your head. Yeah. So maybe they found a link between there was a similarity between schizophrenia yeah. and mind control. Yeah. They, I mean, it seems similar because you're hearing and seeing things. Yeah. That aren't there. That don't exist interesting okay uh so the prisoners were used because they were bribed with shorter sentences if they volunteered crazy which is crazy uh whitey bulger said that it was eight guys were injected with massive amounts of lsd once a week and were observed for 24 hours and given tests uh, he said he experienced nightmares, hallucinations, and paranoia. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. The doctors would hook them up to machines and ask questions like, did you ever kill anyone or would you kill someone? He said the test caused sleeping problems and nightmares that he had for the rest of his life. And he said everyone felt suicidal and depressed after the experiments. And that, yeah. that went on for about, I think, 18 months. That's crazy. Everyone, yeah. all the um, interviews I saw with people who were like test subjects for MK Ultra, all said they couldn't sleep without medication for the rest of their lives like they had severe trauma Yikes. um ken casey from one flew over the cuckoo's nest said he volunteered for mk ultra trials in college the cia eventually dismissed lsd as too unpredictable <laughs> have you ever done lsd no i have done mushrooms right which is similar i guess i know a lot of people who do lsd microdosing for anxiety yeah that's not the show, The Good Fight. It's really? On, it's on CBS All Access. Uh, this, yeah, she takes, she does microdosing. I don't know if it's LSD or mushrooms or what. Yeah, it's. But I've been reading phenomenon. about it. Yeah, there's a book on it that a bunch of people I know it are reading. It scares me because I did mushrooms like in high school. Yeah, I did it for like a couple of years. I would do it like every few months. It was fun right and i would like see shit but it only lasted like four or five hours yeah it's, it's not a long trip no right? depending on how many mushrooms you take 
Uh, but LSD, I, I don't think I would ever do it. It's just, it's very chemical. Yeah. But, and also and my like, friends who do LSD say that there's not, they don't send, it just makes them more chill, which I feel like is the huh. opposite of what LSD, everything I've ever heard about LSD. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Either. I don't know. Okay. This one is the most interesting. Oh yeah. Thing. Ted Kaczynski said he volunteered while he was at Harvard in 1958 and he went to Harvard when he was like 15 or 16. That's nuts. Uh, he was involved in one of their interrogation studies. So he had to, along with 22 other people, write an essay about their dreams and aspirations. They were then led into a room where electrodes were attached to their heads and then they were subjected to extremely brutal psychological attacks as their essays were read back to them and criticized. <laughs> so they basically were just like, oh, these are your dreams oh well they fucking suck and you fucking suck too like they would just scream at them like for hours and hours and then they were forced to watch a video of themselves being psychologically attacked so they would record that and they would play it back to them for hours and hours and ted kaczynski said that this experiment is what drew him into to live in isolation so become the unabomber yeah so the cia basically created ted kaczynski so it's the idea of if you break someone down hard enough through trauma yes could you build them back up with a dependent it's like emotional abusive relationships yeah it's all for interrogation like can you yeah basically can you break someone it's like um stockholm syndrome yeah could you break someone down hard enough using trauma and then build them back up but force them to depend on you because they're Mm -hmm. you're the only thing they have yeah but it's the government doing that through testing yeah no wonder he became the unabomber so there so, is a correlation between the government and arcade games coming together. Yeah. Yeah, that was interesting. It was um, Atari in the Army. It was called um, Battle Zone, mm-hmm. and it was created by Ed Rotberg, who apparently I've read in a few places was the key programmer also in Polybius. Oh. His name is popped up in a few places. Oh, when that's reading. interesting. Yeah. So if there is a correlation between, like, the government and and arcade games Hmm. it could possibly be like something in this sphere where they're trying like how to well that's what that movie the last starfighter yeah was about it was about recruiting um a kid who he got the high score on this game called starfighter and then he meets the game's designer who's like they create it as a training ground to develop and recruit actual pilots for a a war in space. And that's what the Atari thing was. The yeah. Atari was a battle a tra- zone. Yeah. Battle zone was like a training program. So maybe Polybius was also mm-hmm. some sort of weird subliminal messaging intellectual training program mm-hmm. to see how much they could withstand right. psychological damage. Right. You know, apparently they couldn't. They couldn't. So they wiped it all out. <laughs> Another mission failed. Mission failed. Another possible thing that I thought it was, was maybe it's just the Mandela effect. Right. That's a good yeah. theory. Because, you know, like the Berenstein Berenstein. Yeah. What the fuck? What is the official spelling? Bear- it's Stain. S-T-A-I-N. Right. It's not Stain. Which is, that's insane to me. That is insane. But I think maybe for some reason, genera- generationally, we think that Polybius was a machine, like a gaming right. console growing up that we would see in arcade games. Right. But we're just getting it mixed up with something else. And it's just a Mandela effect. Well, there is a game that a German company created in 1985 called Polyplay. So maybe... That, that could be it. And so it was a collection of eight games, including a puzzler and a space shooter. So maybe people got confused because the if you Google polyplay, it's like the same font as the Polybius, the P-O-L-Y. Interesting. So that's also like maybe people got confused because like the government was actually taking, like coming in and taking those Tempest games to put cameras in. So For- that was actually a thing that was happening. And so in the arcades, we're getting raided by the feds for gambling. So maybe kids kind of put two and two together and they were like fascinated with this like super dangerous game. Made their own a religion. And they made, yeah. Sorry, I'm just, this Baron, this Baron Stain <laughs> Bear thing. Have you not heard of that before? No. Oh, what? No, your life's oh, going to be ruined. Oh, I just ruined your day. Okay, so that's the Mandela effect? The Mandela's effect yeah. is we remember things in differently differently than how they actually are but at like 
generationally, like a whole generation remembers it differently. The bear, it was the Berenstein Bears. That's right. what I thought. And I just looked and it's Berenstain yes. Bears. I know. That's I know. Are you not okay? Sh- I'm shocked. Like I'm literally. Yeah, I thought shocked. I was. I was trying to find. I a love Bears witnessing book. this for the first time for someone. You didn't know about no. this. This was this is like going around like the internet like a while. But there's also you know the Shack, the Sinbad as a genie in a movie. Kazam, Shazam. Do you remember? K- Sh- Kazam. Well, Shack was in Kazam. Kazam. But do you remember Sinbad being a genie in a movie? <laughs> do you remember? <laughs> There's a whole no. okay. Oh really? Oh, see, I remember. I remember it being Sinbad. Distinctly Sinbad wearing a genie costume in a movie, and everyone's like, "Yeah, Sinbad played a genie in a movie." But no, that never fucking happened. Interesting. Never happened. The one thing that someone did find was that he hosted a TBS in the '90s, like a day of movies or something. Oh where he really? Wore a genie costume. Which is what I think oh, everyone okay. was thinking of. But that's weird that everyone would got. I, I oh my god, I need to do tw- twenty examples. Here's a BuzzFeed article that will make everything easy it's for us. Fucking crazy. How Why would it- everyone think? Every single person would think it was Berenstein. I know. I'm sending you an article right now that's gonna make you freak out. Darth <laughs> Vader never says, "Luke, I am your father." He doesn't. No. I swear to God. Forrest Gump never says life is like a box of chocolates. Yes, he does. No, he yes, doesn't. Yes, he fucking no, does. No, he doesn't. Hannibal Lecter never says hello, Clarice. Yes, he does. He doesn't. Forrest Gump says he doesn't say that. No, oh that's my impossible. My mom always said life was like a box of chocolates. You never. Where did that fucking quote come from? And the reason it's called that is because a whole generation of people thought that Nelson Mandela had died. They remember him dying. In, j- in jail, he hadn't, obviously. What? My mom always said, life was like a box of chocolates. Life was. Was instead of is. You never know what you're going to He get. fucking says it. <laughs> life was. Was instead of is. Life is that's like. A, that's, too, that's too small of okay, one. That's not. Okay. I wouldn't count that as Mandela effect. Um, MK Ultra. Right. <laughs> So I think one of my main theories is that definitely that these were part of a mind control or subliminal messaging experiment to a younger demographic of people under this MK Ultra campaign. So I also read a theory. So this first showed up on coinop.org in 2000. It got so much attention that some people think that the creator of CoinOp made it up himself Ooh. because it was picked up by a bunch of gamer magazines and everyone went back to CoinOp to read it. So the site got a lot of traffic. Okay. That's a less popular theory, but it kind of makes sense. Wait, what was the theory? <laughs> Did you say it? Did you- <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, the creator of CoinOp. Oh, the Korea. Okay, that was your- made it up himself. Oh, got it. In the okay. year two thousand to get traffic. Oh, to boost to- traffic. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so he wanted yeah. to boost traffic to his website, so he made up the he made up like a fake name and then got it, which kind of makes sense. Yeah, I guess. Is that your leading theory? You know, it might be. Do you think these machines ever existed? I mean, there are pictures of them online that like people have made. Right. It sounds like a game that would exist. I know. I really... And like I tried to find the origin of like the story and it, it everyone says it comes from coinop.org, the year 2000. Apparently people are like, no, we've been talking about it since the 80s and 90s. But I can't, I mean, nobody knows exactly where it started. So Right, and it's hard like before the genesis of the internet to figure yeah. out how it actually Yeah, because the internet be. didn't come around until like, you know, late 90s anyway. The stuff going on at that time, like the gambling and the government coming in, like maybe just people kind of made up their own stories and maybe this guy was like kind of into the story too and was like, well, I'll just post something about it and see if anyone knows what I'm talking about. And then this crazy guy, Stephen Roach, was like, yeah, I designed it. That is possible. But also if this Stephen Roach guy is the same guy who kidnapped all these children and is still missing to this day. Probably Although hiding dangerous, out in the maybe our next line of research is to try yeah. to find a Stephen Roach. Stephen and Glenda, if you're out there, we're coming for you. Maybe we try <laughs> to find Stephen Roach, and then also maybe we try to find someone who's associated with the MK Ultra 
CIA campaign. Oh. If you're out of the CIA, are you allowed <laughs> to talk about the stuff you were? Oh, what's the NDA question. associated with being in the Ooh, CIA? Probably not, right? You can't just go like writing blogs about black. it. Yeah, you can't just go <laughs> you sex throw the on city blogging about your time in the <laughs> CIA. Yeah, you can't tweet about all the mysteries. <laughs> My boyfriend says that he first heard about Polybius in the 90s. And I oh. said I said early or late and he said mid to late. Interesting. Oh, weird. Where did he hear about it? And now Maria actually did an interview with her boyfriend Craig who knows a lot about video games. Here it is. <laughs> Hi everyone, this is producer Maria on location with a... Arcade aficionado. A arcade aficionado, Craig Anstett. Hi Craig, how's, how's it going? It's great, thank you. So Craig, you're in the arcade world and when I told you that one of our episodes was about Polybius, you had some things to say about it, mostly that you you don't believe it's true. No, I don't believe that's true. And in the, the gaming world, no one believes it's true? It's like a fun myth. No one really thinks. It's kind of like a Loch Ness Monster. No one really believes. Or that Bigfoot footage. Everyone knows it's not real, but it's fun to be like, hey, I'm really into Bigfoot. Have you seen the footage? You know, like if you're like a Bigfoot aficionado, the first thing people bring up when you mention that, they go, oh, yeah, that footage. And you're like, yeah, that's fake. So do on the, the message words and stuff, do people have footage? No, there's no footage. It doesn't exist. Does anyone on the message boards ever say they were part of Polybius or they knew someone? Um, occasionally, somebody will chime in and say that, like, oh, they located one. and But it's always somebody who's not a longtime member of the forums. You know, it's right. someone, you know, just popping in. They have one or two posts and they're like, hey, I just found a... It's like, come on. There's been a couple times where people have faked, like, where they where they get, like, a vintage arcade cabinet Mm-hmm. And they strip it down and they paint it and they a- try to act like it, it was. But, of, of course, the circuit boards are always missing. It's just the shell of the cabinet. Right. So it is crazy that this can this got so far as to still be this rumor when most people in the world of arcading... Arcading, is that enough? Arcading's nice. I like that. And most people in the world of arcading don't believe it to have happened. So, you know, there there's people out there, I guess, that that vouch for it. But when it comes to the arcade guys, nerds, if I, you you guys are... It doesn't matter. Nerd's like a cool thing now. Yeah. You guys are, and girls are very much like, no, it's definitely not true. Yeah, no. It was kind of like this um, urban myth that was created from... The fear tactics that were pushed by pearl clutching whatever Puritans arc- back then. When and this is like late seventies. Space Invaders, which was around seventy eight, I think. That's when it really took off in America. And that's there were arcade games before that, but they weren't they didn't really have like like Pong, you couldn't play that with one person. Mm-hmm. So it was like, you know, it didn't really but then when Space Invaders came out, that was like you're against the machine. The machine was actually they they finally got to the point where the machine was smart enough, you know, in a primitive way to fight back. And then that's when arcade games really took off. And people were freaked out, like uh, moms and dads, because kids were dumping so much money into the games that they it, it's almost like um it's almost like heavy metal music where they were like this is corrupting our youth. It's the same thing that you've heard, you know, you've heard with video games even now. They're like, you know, this causes violence. That started in the late 70s. They're like, oh, it makes boys more aggressive. You know, they're stealing to, to sell items, to get money to play video games. So basically you create this fear around it. And then there's actual legitimate stories of, you know, some kid somewhere having an epileptic seizure because he's playing a video game. Right. There's that. And there's like a kid... Uh, dropped out of a, or an older man dropped out of a heart attack because he was so excitedly playing so all those stories you know build the myth and then people go oh yeah it was a government thing you know it was like plus it i don't know if it's i'm sh- i'm not sh- positive but i think that myth was started around the time that that last starfighter movie came out where it's a like aliens put an arcade game in like uh i believe it's a trailer park they put it like they put this video game there in order to 
find whoever the best is at playing that game, then they know they'll be a good starfighter pilot. So then they come to Earth and kidnap the guy and make him fight in their military. Right. And so it's kind of like tied to that. Like, let, I don't know. Let me ask you this, though, because a lot of people believe that this was part of MK, an MK Ultra plot. Do you think that's a possibility? Well, I would want nothing more than for that to be real. I don't know. I mean, I... But I, you know MK is real. Yes, I do. So, and you know that they are now making video games for kids to join the army, basically, yeah, and stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not that far-fetched if you think about it, if you go back in time and put... No, this is true. I'm sure when video games came about, um, yeah, there was like, you know, Atari was this like, basically a company basically run by a hippie you yeah. know Nolan Bushnell there was all a bunch of hippies like that ran, and it was all about like peace and everything and then the military came in they're like hey we realize the power of these games so can you make one that's a trainer for our, I mean obviously that's a trainer for an actual existing military vehicle um, but there were a couple of employees that uh left Atari because of that because they didn't want to be involved with military so I mean you could uh, it, it, it I just don't think there, the myth around Polybius is that it's this thing that's going to mentally hypnotize you. And I don't, you know, who knows, but it just, it was so primitive at that time. When did it, when, when is it supposedly come out? When, when did that exist? I'm not sure. Cause I mean like the first color video game was 79, I believe. But which they was, were doing MK ultra in the seventies. So why not? You know? Well, right. But I'm saying, if the it depends on when the myth starts because if the first color video game comes out, commercial color video game comes out in 1979, which is Galaxian. I mean, you can only assume because the rumor is you know Polybius used these flashing colors and that's how it triggered this mind control. It would have to be post 1979, right? Right. Well, I guess that is probably right because the, yeah, I think that rumor did start like in the mid 80s, so that would make sense. What? It just seems like, I'm sorry to interrupt you, it no, just seems like a, a little obvious of a myth. Yeah, the more like an urban legend than... Um, it, I mean, yeah, a, a video game that uses flashing color, like you put your quarter in, yet there's no photographs. No kid had ever taken a photograph in front of a game. No kid was proud to get the high score and took a picture of the screen. No, you know what I mean? Like, no, nobody else knew about this. You know, who? I mean... I mean, you can just keep going with these conspiracies. You can say, oh, well, you know, the government killed whoever. You know, you could, you can just, anything could be true then, really. Well, it's great. You know, thank you so much. We really appreciate hearing from someone on the front lines of the arcade world. Um, yeah, front lines. Yeah. Yeah. The front message boards. Yeah. So you heard it here that according to Arcadians. <laughs> Polybius does not exist. Well, Craig, thank you so much, and thank you for being part of Web Crawlers. I'm happy to be here. Bye. Bye. No, I think I I I know that I think the general consensus is that it's not a real thing, maybe, or that it's just a myth. I 100 percent do think that's like a Manchurian candidate. <laughs> <laughs> testing Mandela candidate subliminal messaging 80s 90s phenomenon that the government was doing on a generation of kids but if you guys have any ideas let us know let us know Melissa <laughs> yes <laughs> where where can people give us their ideas about Polybius because I think we we want to know more yeah on Twitter at web crawlers pod same same at instagram you can email us web crawlers pod at gmail.com yeah and if you're in the cia feel free to contact us and we won't let anyone know anonymously send us from an anonymous aol email address yeah get a burner email address or a burner phone if you're in the cia and let us know because i i gotta get to the bottom of this Anyways, thank you so much for listening. <laughs> I'm Allie Siegel. And I'm Melissa Stetton. Keep sleuthing. So sleuth until you darn tootin'. Bye.
original. Powered by ACAST.